This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Hey everybody, right here I have a classic keychain laser pointer. I'm sure most of you have messed with one of these at some point. I mean, you can buy them pretty much anywhere and they're super cheap online. Now if you're disappointed that you can't use these things to light stuff on fire, then you're definitely not alone. But luckily the technology exists to change that. In fact, upgrading one of these laser pointers is probably the most requested project on this channel. So without further ado, let's get started. Oh yeah, before I go on, I should warn you that all the crazy stuff you're about to see was done completely for educational purposes. I mean, if you were to try any of this stuff at home, you'd probably die. So yeah, please don't try this at home. Now I don't know about you guys, but I like it when my lasers are a fire hazard. Now that being said, there are a few circumstances where you're better off using these puny lasers in their unmodified state. For one, presentations. I know it's tempting to flex your biggest laser when giving a presentation, but unless you're on Zoom, it's best to keep your audience's retinas intact. Another occasion where a weak pointer is preferred to a death ray is for playing with pets. In fact, a red laser pointer like this is the only laser I recommend for playtime with your little fluff balls. If your laser looks like this, this, or this, then you definitely shouldn't use it with your pets. That's not to say other colors of light are inherently dangerous, but 99 times out of 100, if you buy a laser online that isn't a red keychain, it's going to be well over the safety limit and too much of a danger for your pet. Now there's other interesting stuff you can do with these pointers as well, like experimenting with refraction or diffraction, or testing for nearsightedness, or erasing glow-in-the-dark stuff, and a bunch of other tricks as well, but I'll leave that stuff for other YouTubers, because I just want an insanely powerful laser that'll fit on my keychain. It's funny, because of the few searches I made to buy some of these laser pointers, I'm already getting spammed with ads for illegal lasers. To be fair, these aren't as weird as the ads I get for looking up vacuum tubes, or even worse, these. Like, come on, I'm not even a weeb. This is what being cyberstalked by massive corporations looks like, especially when they make bad assumptions about my data. Now luckily there's an easy way around this, and in fact I'd like to introduce you to my sponsor Surfshark. With Surfshark's clean web service, it's super easy to get rid of these annoying ads and stop these companies from stalking me. However, this really just scratches the surface of what Surfshark has to offer. Surfshark is actually the VPN service that I personally use, and they're the only VPN to allow account use across unlimited devices. Now there are a lot of reasons why someone might find a VPN useful, but my biggest reason is for bypassing throttling. For one, simply blocking your ISP from tracking you is a great way to stop being throttled when you watch videos or go to a site that your ISP doesn't like. For me specifically, I run exclusively on hotspot data and I pay for 50 gigabytes of data a month. However, I get throttled to a snail's crawl pace when I pass just 15 gigabytes of hotspot use. Now this is just a blatant money grab since I'm allowed to use the full 50 gigabytes of my phone. Thanks to Surfshark and some code I found on Google, I'm able to use the full 50 gigabytes I paid for. Bypassing censorship is another popular use of Surfshark. Content not available in my country? No problem. I'll just use Surfshark to virtually put my computer in a country where it is available. Use my code Styropyro to get 84% off in an extra 4 months free. The link's in the description below, and there's a 30 day money back guarantee so you can try it out at no risk to yourself. So yeah, I want to give a big thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Alright, so how do I make this thing stronger? Without even modifying the internals, I can always just jam in a fourth little button cell. The power increase is pretty small though, and it definitely won't be setting fire to anything. Since there isn't space to jam in a fifth cell, I'm hooking it up to a bench power supply so I can take the voltage even higher. Alright, I'm starting at the rated voltage, so we have a reference here. Um, hmm. So, uh, I think it's actually dead. I'd even give it more than its rated voltage yet. Well, I am now, but it clearly isn't fixing anything. I went ahead and took apart that laser pointer and I think I found the problem. I mean, to put it lightly, there are literally children out there that would have done a better job designing this. The driver circuit is literally just a switch and resistor. No filter cap, let alone any sort of current regulation. I think the reason they can get away with this is due to the high internal resistance of these little button cells. That means that it may have actually been my bench supply that killed it, even though the voltage was set correctly. Now notice that the bare laser diode is mounted directly on the circuit board here with very little in terms of heat sinking. A powerful laser diode would fry itself in seconds in a configuration like this, so that only means that this puny laser diode was never capable of much power in the first place. You know, maybe I've been too hard on the simplicity of this thing, cause let's be honest, most of what I make is garbage as well. Now that being said, this thing needs some serious hardware upgrades, and first of all I'm going to need a stronger laser diode. This is actually the perfect opportunity to justify my hoard of computer trash. I probably already have a suitable diode sitting in the DVD burner of a dead computer. 
extracting these diodes can be tricky, but with a careful touch it can be done pretty reliably. I'd call that a successful harvest. I don't know if you noticed, but I actually pulled two laser diodes out of that DVD burner, and I'm running them off of the computer's power supply. This one was used for writing DVDs, and this one was used for writing CDs. Now don't let the dim output on this one fool you, this laser is actually very dangerous. Things look quite a bit different on an IR camera, and you can see just how much IR light this laser is producing. Now this is actually kind of scary, since if someone pulled this diode as opposed to the DVD diode and didn't know any better, they might think it's just a broken red laser due to the dim beam, but in reality it's actually an extremely dangerous near IR laser. I always find it entertaining to stick my hand in the beam of a near IR laser like this. The wavelength of light is poorly absorbed by flesh, so most of the light makes it through my hand, and it lights up my veins while doing so. In fact, I've been hit by a laser of the same wavelength but a thousand times stronger without even getting burned. Of course the real danger from lasers isn't skin burns, it's taking a reflection and going blind forever. The red laser from the DVD burner is not only considerably brighter, but it's also a few times more powerful than the CD laser, so obviously this is the diode that will be going in the keychain laser. To top it off, these lasers can do some tricks that you can't even pull off with stronger blue laser diodes. This is because these DVD lasers have excellent beam quality compared to most hobby burning lasers. I'll go more into this later, but the improved beam quality is even suitable for building an optical trap. When I stick this marker in the focal point of the laser beam, pieces of it burn off as expected. However, some of those particles actually get trapped there, and they'll stay there indefinitely if the air is still. If you hate yourself enough, I suggest checking out my video on this Nobel Prize winning phenomenon. Alright, that's enough screwing around. It's time to jam this in a laser pointer. These pointers are just press fit together, so it isn't too difficult to get them apart. I obviously don't need the original laser diode since it's dead, but I do need the driver board it's on. Unlike the original driver, I need something with current regulation so the diode doesn't just fry itself the second it's turned on. Now luckily I don't have to design anything fancy, and that's because I have these. This is the AMC7135, an LED driver IC that used to be very popular among hobbyists for driving DVD lasers. I want to thank Ice Cruncher from the Laser Forums for reminding me of these things, because I actually have some of these chips left over after buying some 13 years ago. Along with a filter capacitor, these make a simple and compact way of driving a DVD laser. The original switchboard gives power to the new driver here, and the circuit is completed through the conductive casing. Now what about batteries? The short circuit current on these button cells is pathetically low, so clearly I need something a bit better. Thankfully I bought some 10180 cells specifically for this project. It turns out that these are actually the cutest batteries I've ever used on this channel. Alright, here goes nothing. Okay, that's pretty cool. Quite the upgrade compared to the original one, that's for sure. Not gonna lie, this thing's absurd. I mean, it feels like a toy, but it's actually extremely dangerous. Most importantly though, it can burn stuff, and that's what matters the most. Let's test that out by lighting a couple matches. Nice. Some balloons. What about some thin plastic? Ha! Huh, it's like a tiny little lightsaber. Here's one that isn't as visually impressive, but is still very cool. When I hit this block of wood with a laser, it makes a little wisp of smoke and even engraves it a little. Now let me put some laser goggles in front of the camera to filter out that red light. See those white flashes there? That's from bits of the material getting white hot. These DVD lasers are single spatial mode, which means the output can be focused down to an extremely tiny point. This high beam quality is necessary for reading or writing the minuscule grooves of optical discs. This also means that the power densities obtainable are off the charts. I did some rough calculations to give you an idea on how crazy these numbers can get. 
A fraction of a watt doesn't seem like much, but when that's focused onto a spot a hundredth of the width of a human hair, that gives an optical power density that's 10,000 times higher than the sun's surface. Using this value, you can calculate the upper limit of temperature for an object being heated by the laser. A tiny black particle in an environment where the only loss of heat is via radiation would heat to nearly 60,000 degrees by the laser. If you look at volume power densities, you're dealing with values that are several orders of magnitude higher than what you'd find inside a nuclear reactor. These crazy numbers give some insight into why a device with relatively low output power can burn stuff, or more importantly, why they're an extreme eye hazard. I mean, you can see right here why a direct hit from the laser is like staring into a million suns. For those calculations, I just used ballpark estimates for the total output power, but I can actually measure it directly with my Pronto Laser Power Meter by Gentech EO. Okay, so around 200 milliwatts or so. Hmm. I mean, it is 40 times stronger than what can legally be sold as a laser pointer, but it also doesn't quite make it into the most dangerous classification of all, which is Class 4. I'm going to have to do better than this. I need at least 500 milliwatts to achieve that Class 4 rating, but unfortunately I won't be able to do that with this laser, so I'm going to need an even stronger laser diode. Now, I still want to use red diodes for a few reasons. For one, red lasers don't get much love from the hobbyists anymore, and that's because huge blue lasers are easily attainable. But also, I'm lazy, and the lower forward voltage is easier to deal with. Choosing the right laser diode gets tricky when you're dealing with red, and there aren't many options to pick from. Using the traditional strategy of buying sketchy laser parts on eBay, you might be tempted to buy the most powerful diode you can find. It turns out that if you go this route, you'll be buying what's perhaps the most cursed laser diode on the market. Yup, that thing makes three separate laser beams. Sure, it makes a ton of red light, but combining those beams into one would be incredibly difficult, especially in a tiny laser pointer. This must have been intended for use as just a compact red light source, because I don't know of anything that could make use of a beam like that. Lowering your expectations a bit will lead you to this laser diode or one very similar. It's not 2.5 watts like the Tri-Beam Monster, but it does still cross the Class 4 threshold. That being said, this thing still produces an absolutely garbage beam. I mean, it's basically a line in the far field, and that's because one axis of the beam diverges much faster than the other. Hobbyists do make use of trash beams like this by using various methods of beam correction, but I don't exactly have the space inside a keychain laser to jam in a cylindrical lens telescope. Now I did come across a listing for some powerful red diodes that claim to have fast axis correction. Is there a manufacturer listed? No. Is the data sheet made up? Probably. So it must be a scam, right? Nope. These are actually as impressive as they are sketchy. What's special about this diode is that a tiny fiber lens is placed immediately in front of the emitter, and it only changes the exit angle of one axis of the beam. In this case, the fast axis collimator makes it so the divergence on each axis is roughly the same, which gives a square beam when collimated in the far field. This is much more acceptable than dealing with a line, and to top it off, this laser diode is rated for over a watt. Now it's time to jam this scary piece of technology inside a laser pointer. As usual for a build like this, I never plan anything out, and just start adding and moving parts around until things fit and work. For a driver, I just wired a few of these AMC7135 chips in parallel, and threw in a filter cap for good measure. The high current draw means that the original switch probably wouldn't hold up here, so I wired it so that it just signals to a MOSFET to handle the power switching. Now I know what you're thinking, all that stuff jammed in such a tiny housing has got to be a thermal nightmare, right? Yes. Jamming everything together wasn't easy, but I did it and now it's time to power it up. Hopefully my cute batteries will hold up to the extra power demand. All right, here goes nothing. Oh my gosh, that thing should not exist. Just to give you an idea on how dumb this thing is, if you were to come across a laser of similar power in a lab, it would have to be bolted to a table in a locked room with all the windows blacked out, and anybody who wanted to use it would have to go through laser safety training. Now, just because it's dumb doesn't mean it isn't awesome. In fact, one of the biggest improvements of this build over the DVD laser is in the brightness increase. The wavelength is about 20 nanometers shorter on this one, which makes it massively brighter, and also slightly more orange. Watt for watt, the color itself is actually three times brighter than from the DVD laser, and that's without even considering the extra power. Of course, the biggest improvement of all is in its burning capabilities. The new laser can burn things much faster than the DVD laser, and it can punch through thicker materials as well. However, the beam quality is quite a bit worse, and ironically, this means the max attainable power density is also lower. Even so, the power increase is high enough to overcome the wider beam when it comes to most burning tricks. An even cooler trick for this laser is using it with glow-in-the-dark surfaces. 
I've demonstrated on my channel before what a violet or UV laser looks like when used on a surface like this. However, when you try this with red light, the photon energy is just too low to excite the material. That being said, if I first excite the surface with something like a camera flash and then hit it with a red laser, the red light actually erases the glow. It's as if it's some quantum mechanical eraser. I can think of two separate mechanisms for why this happens. Heating by the laser does play a role here, and even rubbing the surface with my finger heats it enough via friction to cause a streak of brighter glow. This area would eventually become slightly dimmer than the surroundings due to faster loss of stored energy. Now the main reason goes into the quantum mechanics of how these phosphorescent materials work in the first place. In the related phenomenon, fluorescence, a material absorbs light of higher energy and releases light of lower energy soon after. Phosphorescence is like this, except there's a much longer period of time between absorption and emission of light. This is because the light releasing step is actually a forbidden transition. That is that the quantum mechanical selection rules forbid the transition from happening under usual approximations. However, effects from things like heat and other weak interactions allow the probability of relaxation to go slightly above zero, which allows the material to slowly release light over minutes or hours. The red light may be too weak to directly excite the material, but the photons do have enough energy to further excite the already excited material. This promotes electrons to energy levels where energy release is allowed, and thus you get a short, bright release of light where the laser hits, followed by no more light emission as the material there is depleted of energy. Alright, so one thing I've yet to do is measure the output power of this little laser. Let's see what we have here. Okay, about 800 milliwatts or so. Well, the batteries must be sagging a bit, but at least it's well into the class 4 territory. When it comes to handheld lasers, I like setting records, even if that means chasing some obscure measure that others have yet to try competing in. Earlier this year I showed you the most powerful CW handheld laser in the world, and a couple years ago I showed you the brightest handheld laser for its size. The record I was going for in this video was the highest power to weight ratio in a handheld laser. Now my laser should win this hands down, right? Well, it turns out a 15 year old in Greece named Ioannis has already built something better. My laser has a power to mass ratio of a little over 50 milliwatts per gram. His laser weighs more, but it's also much more powerful, giving a ratio of roughly 60 milliwatts per gram. That's right, a literal child beat me at my own game, and I made up the rules! Even more impressive is that he designed the high current, high efficiency driver that makes his build possible. I can't just finish this video without at least beating the record, so thanks to this kid, now I have to build something really ridiculous. For starters, I'm going to have to abandon red laser diodes in exchange for more powerful blue ones. There's a reason most of my reckless laser projects use blue lasers, and that's because the diodes are available in higher powers than any other visible wavelength. I need roughly a watt to break the record I'm after, and this is a walk in the park for most of the blue laser diodes I have on hand. This does bring up another issue though. These diodes have a higher forward voltage than the red laser I was using, which means the voltage of these batteries is too low without some sort of boost circuit. Thankfully, I already have the perfect driver on hand. This tiny boost driver was designed by the rogue engineer from Belarus who goes by Spirit. It's funny, because the only reason he designed this impressive little circuit was just to prove a point. The boosting ability along with a wide input range means I can push my poor little batteries to their absolute limits, and the enable feature means I don't have to jam in a separate MOSFET to prevent eating the little switch. Not surprisingly, the driver works great with a 1 watt blue laser diode, and jamming all that stuff in the pointer housing went easier than expected. Now that is what I call a reckless testament to modern technology. A laser this size definitely shouldn't be that bright, and it definitely shouldn't be so good at lighting things on fire either. Most materials tend to absorb blue light stronger than red light, so even at similar power levels, blue lasers tend to be better at burning things. Now for the million dollar question, does it break the record? The laser weighs only 13 and a half grams, which means I only need a little over 800 milliwatts to break the record. Here goes nothing. Wait, what? Are you kidding me? The problem here isn't with the driver, as the laser outputs the expected power when hooked to my bench supply. I think I've just finally hit the limit here with these little batteries. I guess at this point I just have to concede defeat. I'm just kidding, it's time to build an abomination. Enter the supercapacitor. With properties somewhere between a battery and a capacitor, these can provide higher current than my batteries with the drawback of lower energy storage. A single one of these would easily operate the blue keychain laser, but if I'm going to go this route, I might as well knock that record out of the park. I'll be using these super caps to drive an extremely powerful laser diode that's capable of several watts. What's so cursed about my plan here is that I won't be using a driver. I'm hoping I can rely on the super caps ESR to prevent frying the laser. Of course, this requires some trial and error, because I'm not even going to bother with calculations. 
I stuck a couple super caps in series and then discharged them through a resistor of progressively lower values to watch the peak current. Eventually, I was able to remove the resistor entirely and run the laser diode directly off the super caps. It's funny, because this method brings us full circle to the original driver of these puny keychain lasers. In both cases, they're relying on what amounts to some inexact resistance to prevent the laser from being destroyed. The main difference is that this laser should be almost a thousand times stronger. Jamming all that stuff in the pointer was incredibly sketchy, especially since those super caps are live. The super caps are in there for good, so I had to add this ugly port on the side for recharging it when it dies after 30 seconds of use. Kids, this is why you go to engineering school, so you don't build absolute garbage like this. Well, I really hope this thing doesn't explode. Holy f heck, that thing's bright. Yup, that is definitely the worst thing I've ever made. So, does it break the record? The laser weighs a little under 17 grams, which means I need a hair over a watt to achieve this. The moment of truth. Wow, look at that, over three watts. Yeah, it's dropping pretty fast now, but still holding over a watt. That is one scary keychain laser, and I'm both proud and embarrassed to share it with you guys. This would be an awesome opportunity for a giveaway, since I really don't know what to do with all these lasers. Unfortunately, I would go to jail if I did this, so that means I have to do the next best thing, and light a ton of stuff on fire. Well, that's about all I have for you today, so until the next time, stay safe and happy lazing.